The Invalid's Story by Mark Twain This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite The Invalid's Story by Mark Twain I seem sixty and married, but these effects are due to my condition and sufferings, for I am a bachelor and only forty-one. It will be hard for you to believe that I, who am now but a shadow, was a hale, hardy man two short years ago, a man of iron, a very athlete. Yet such is the simple truth. But stranger still than this fact is the way in which I lost my health. I lost it through helping to take care of a box of guns on a two-hundred-mile railway journey one winter's night. It is the actual truth, and I will tell you about it. I belong in Cleveland, Ohio. One winter's night two years ago I reached home just after dark in a driving snowstorm, and the first thing I heard when I entered the house was that my dearest boyhood friend and schoolmate, John B. Hackett, had died the day before and that his last utterance had been a desire that I would take his remains home to his poor old father and mother in Wisconsin. I was greatly shocked and grieved, but there was no time to waste in emotions. I must start at once. I took the card marked Deacon Levi Hackett, Bethlehem, Wisconsin, and hurried off through the whistling storm to the railway station. Arrived there, I found the long white pine box which had been described to me. I fastened the card to it with some tacks, saw it put safely aboard an express car, and then ran into the eating room to provide myself with a sandwich and some cigars. When I returned presently, there was my coffin box back again, apparently, and a young fellow examining around it with a card in his hands and some tacks and a hammer. I was astonished and puzzled. He began to nail on his card, and I rushed out to the express car in a good deal of state of mind to ask for an explanation. But no, there was my box all right in the express car. It hadn't been disturbed. The fact is that without my suspecting it, a prodigious mistake had been made. I was carrying off a box of guns which that young fellow had come to the station to ship to a rifle company in Peoria, Illinois, and he had got my corpse. Just then the conductor sung out, All aboard! And I jumped into the express car and got a comfortable seat on a bale of buckets. The expressman was there, hard at work, a plain man of fifty, with a simple, honest, good-natured face and a breezy, practical heartiness in his general style. As the train moved off, a stranger skipped into the car and set a package of peculiarly mature and capable Limburger cheese on one end of my coffin box. I mean, my box of guns. That is to say, I know now that it was Limburger cheese, but at the time I never had heard of the article in my life and, of course, was wholly ignorant of its character. Well, we sped through the wild night. The bitter storm raged on. A cheerless misery stole over me. My heart went down, down, down. The old expressman made a brisk remark or two about the tempest and the arctic weather, slammed his sliding doors to and bolted them, closed his window down tight, and then went bustling around here and there and yonder, setting things to rights, and all the time contentedly humming sweet by and by, in a low tone, and flatting a good deal. Presently I began to detect a most evil and searching odor stealing about on the frozen air. This depressed my spirit still more, because, of course, I attributed it to my poor departed friend. There was something infinitely saddening about his calling himself to my remembrance in this dumb, pathetic way, so it was hard to keep the tears back. Moreover, it distressed me on account of the old gentleman who I was afraid might notice it. However, he went humming tranquilly on and gave no sign, and for this I was grateful. Grateful, yes, but still uneasy and soon I began to feel more and more uneasy every minute, for every minute that went by that odor thickened up the more, and got to be more and more gamey and hard to stand. Presently, having got things arranged to his satisfaction, the expressman got some wood and made up a tremendous fire in his stove. This distressed me more than I can tell, for I could not but feel that it was a mistake. I was sure that the effect would be deleterious upon my poor departed friend. 
Thompson, the expressman's name was Thompson, as I found out in the course of the night, now went poking around his car, stopping up whatever stray cracks he could find, remarking that it didn't make any difference what kind of a night it was outside. He calculated to make us comfortable anyway. I said nothing, but I believed he was not choosing the right way. Meantime he was humming to himself, just as before, and meantime, too, the stove was getting hotter and hotter, and the place closer and closer. I felt myself growing pale and qualmish, but grieved in silence and said nothing. Soon I noticed that the sweet by-and-by was gradually fading out. Next it ceased altogether, and there was an ominous stillness. After a few moments Thompson said, Phew! I reckon it ain't no cinnamon I've loaded up this here stove with. He gasped once or twice, then moved toward the cuff, uh, gun box, stood over that Limburger cheese part of a moment, then came back and sat down near me, looking a good deal impressed. After a contemplative pause, he said, indicating the box with a gesture, Friend of yourn? Yes, I said with a sigh. He's pretty ripe, ain't he? Nothing further was said for perhaps a couple of minutes, each being busy with his own thoughts. Then Thompson said in a low and awed voice, Sometimes it's uncertain whether they're really gone or not. Seem gone, you know, body warm, joints limber, and so, although you think they're gone, you don't really know. I've had cases in my car. It's perfectly awful, because you don't know what minute they'll rise up and look at you. Then, after a pause, and slightly lifting his elbow toward the box. But he ain't in no trance. No, sir, I, I go to bail for him. We sat some time in meditative silence, listening to the wind and the roar of the train. Then Thompson said, with a good deal of feeling, Well, well, we've all got to go. There ain't no getting around it. Man that is born of woman is of few days and far between, as Scripture says. Yes. You can look at it any way you want to. It's awful solemn and curious they ain't nobody can get around it. All's got to go. Just everybody, as you might say. One day you're party and strong. Here he scrambled to his feet and broke a pane and stretched his nose out at it a moment or two, then sat down again while I struggled up and thrust my nose out at the same place. And this we kept on doing every now and then. And the next day he's cut down like grass, and the places which knowed him then knows him no more forever, as Scripture says. Yes, indeedy, it's awful solemn and curious. But we've all got to go, one time or another. They ain't no getting around it. There was another long pause. Then, what did he die of? I said I didn't know. How, how long has he been dead? It seemed judicious to enlarge the facts to fit the probabilities. So I said, mm, two or three days. But it did no good, for Thompson received it with an injured look, which plainly said, two or three years, you mean. Then he went right along, placidly ignoring my statement, and gave his views at considerable length upon the unwisdom of putting off burials too long. Then he lounged off toward the box, stood a moment then came back on a sharp trot and visited the broken pane, observing, "'Twould have been a dumb sight better all around if they'd started him along last summer." Thompson sat down and buried his face in his red silk handkerchief, and began to slowly sway and rock his body like one who is doing his best to endure the almost unendurable. By this time the fragrance, if you may call it a fragrance, was just about suffocating, as near as you can come at it. Thompson's face was turning gray. I knew mine hadn't any color left in it. By and by Thompson rested his forehead on his left hand with his elbow on his knee and sort of waved his red handkerchief toward the box with his other hand and said, I've carried a many one of them. Some of them considered overdue, too. But lordy, he just lays over em all, and does it easy, Cap. They was heliotrope to him. This recognition of my poor friend gratified me in spite of the sad circumstances, because it had so much the sound of a compliment. Pretty soon it was plain that something had got to be done. I suggested cigars. Thompson thought it was a good idea. He said, likely, it'll modify him some. 
We puffed gingerly along for a while and tried hard to imagine that things were improved. But it wasn't any use. Before very long, and without any consultation, both cigars were dropped quietly from our nerveless fingers at the same moment. Thompson said with a sigh, No, Cap, it don't modify him worth a cent. Fact is, it makes him worse, because it appears to stir up his ambition. What do you reckon we better do now? I was not able to suggest anything. Indeed, I had to be swallowing and swallowing all the time, and did not like to trust myself to speak. Thompson fell to maundering in a desultory and low-spirited way about the miserable experiences of this night, and he got to referring to my poor friend by various titles, sometimes military ones, sometimes civil ones, and I noticed that as fast as my poor friend's effectiveness grew, Thompson promoted him accordingly, gave him a bigger title. Finally, he said, I've got an idea. Supposin' we buckle down to it and give the colonel a bit of a shove toward the other end of the car. About ten foot, say. He wouldn't have so much influence then, don't you reckon? I said it was a good scheme, so we took in a good fresh breath at the broken pane, calculating to hold it till we got through. Then we went there and bent over that deadly cheese and took a grip on the box. Thompson nodded. Already? and then we threw ourselves forward with all our might, but Thompson slipped and slumped down with his nose on the cheese and his breath got loose. He gagged and gasped and floundered up and made a break for the door, pawing the air and saying hoarsely, Don't hinder me! Give me the road! I'm a-dying! Give me the road! Out on the cold platform I sat down and held his head a while, and he revived. Presently he said, Do you reckon we started the general any? I said no. We hadn't budged him. Well, then, that idea's up the flume. We got to think up something else. He's suited where he is, I reckon, and if that's the way he feels about it, and has made up his mind that he don't wish to be disturbed, you bet he's a going to have his own way in the business. Yes, better leave him right where he is, long as he wants it so, because he holds all the trumps, don't you know? And so it stands to reason that the man that lays out to alter his plans for him is going to get left. But we couldn't stay out there in that mad storm. We should have frozen to death. So we went in again and shut the door and began to suffer once more and take turns at the break in the window. By and by, as we were starting away from a station where we had stopped a moment, Thompson pranced in cheerily and exclaimed, We're all right now. I reckon we've got the Commodore this time. I judge I've got the stuff here that'll take the tuck out of him. It was carbolic acid. He had a carboy of it. He sprinkled it all around, everywhere. In fact, he drenched everything with it, rifle box, cheese, and all. Then we sat down, feeling pretty hopeful. But it wasn't for long. You see, the two perfumes began to mix, and then, well, pretty soon we made a break for the door, and out there Thompson swabbed his face with his bandana and said in a kind of disheartened way, It ain't no use. We can't buck again him. He just utilizes everything we put up to modify him with, and gives it his own flavor and plays it back on us. Why, Cap, don't you know, it's as much as a hundred times worse in there now than it was when he first got a-goin'. I never did see one of em warm up to his work so, and take such a doomnation interest in it. No, sir, I never did as long as I've been on the road, and I've carried a many one of em, as I was tellin' you. We went in again, after we were frozen pretty stiff. But, my, we, we couldn't stay in now. So we just waltzed back and forth, freezing and thawing and stifling by turns. In about an hour we stopped at another station, and as we left it, Thompson came in with a bag and said, Cap, I'm a gonna chance him one more time. Just this once. And if we don't fetch him this time, the thing for us to do is to just throw up the sponge and withdraw from the canvas. That's the way I put it up. He had brought a lot of chicken feathers, and dried apples, and leaf tobacco, and rags, and old shoes, and sulfur, and asafoetida, and one thing or another, and he piled them on a breath of sheet iron in the middle of the floor, and set fire to them. When they got well started, I couldn't see myself how even the corpse could stand it. All that went before was just simple poetry to that smell. But mind you, the original smell stood up out of it just as sublime as ever. Fact is, these other smells just seemed to give it a better hold, 
and my, how rich it was! I didn't make these reflections there. There wasn't time. Made them on the platform. And breaking for the platform, Thompson got suffocated and fell, and before I got him dragged out, which I did by the collar, I was mighty near gone myself. When we revived, Thompson said dejectedly, We got to stay out here, Cap. We got to do it. They ain't no other way. The governor wants to travel alone, and he's fixed so he can outvote us. And presently he added, And don't you know we're poisoned? It's our last trip. You can make up your mind to it. Typhoid fever is what's going to come of this. I feel it a-coming right now. Yes, sir, we're elected just as sure as you're born. We were taken from the platform an hour later, frozen and insensible at the next station, and I went straight off into a virulent fever and never knew anything again for three weeks. I found out then that I had spent that awful night with a harmless box of rifles and a lot of innocent cheese. But the news was too late to save me. Imagination had done its work, and my health was permanently shattered. Neither Bermuda nor any other land can ever bring it back to me. This is my last trip. I am on my way home to die. End of The Invalid Story by Mark Twain